Well, good afternoon, everyone. I would um, uh, just like to welcome you all to um, this fantastic research launch. We're really excited about it. And it's about the uh, lived experience of working from home in the outer suburbs. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you today from the land of the Boon people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. My name is Bronwyn Clark. I'm the Executive Officer of the National Growth Areas Alliance, and I'm really pleased to say that we have around 60 people joining us from around the country today. Um, I'd like to particularly welcome the mayors and councillors of our member councils as well as the parliamentarians, advisors, and industry experts who are also joining us today. In particular, I'd just like to introduce and welcome our panelists and presenters today. So Richard Frost, Managing Director of Quantum Market Research. Anita Ganguly from Associate Director from Quantum Market Research and Dr. Kim Johnson from Astro Lab Group. So a little bit of housekeeping to start with. Uh, please keep your microphones muted during the presentations. There will be a Q&A session um, after uh, Richard, Anita and Kim have made their presentations. And you can uh, look down at the bottom of your screen to the Q&A button and type your questions in there. Um, if there are a lot of questions, we'll just prioritise the most popular ones um, or ones that are repeated. So. Um, please uh, feel free to add your questions during the sessions, then we'll address them at the end. So just to note also, we are recording this webinar and uh, we will uh, be making it available um, to our members um, on our website. So before we jump into the research presentations, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit because um, as I can see, um, like most of you and, and most of the people attending, I'm, I'm presuming are working from home today and um, have been for several months now. So we know that uh, in our own lives, the COVID related restrictions are continuing to completely change the way we work and to change our communities and how our cities function. So at the moment here in Melbourne, we're really feeling that quite severely. Um, but I know that some of those restrictions have been lifted across the country. Here at the National Growth Areas Alliance, we realised quickly that we needed to capture that experience of the COVID restrictions and the shift that has happened to working from home. Uh, we needed to find out what it was like while it was happening. And so we commissioned some research that will be presented today to produce a snapshot of how people in growth areas and, and Australia's outer suburbs are working from home. Um, it will help us and hopefully it will help policy and decision makers in the future to really see the opportunities that are arising from this situation. Now we know that not everyone has been able to work from home and that many people sadly no longer have the opportunity to work at all. Uh, but this study is looking at people who can work from our home and who have worked from home in uh, growth areas across Australia. And we found out what it's meant for them, for their work and for their household. So just a note for those who might not be familiar, um, too familiar with our work. When I talk about uh, growth areas, we're talking about those um, cities, towns and suburbs on the outskirts of the capital cities, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, uh, Perth and Brisbane. So the areas where over um, the last generation populations have doubled and each year they are growing at double the national rate. They're characterised <laughs> by significant greenfield development um, and by communities arriving in a new location without the infrastructure that others take for granted. So today we're going to explore the working from home experience from two perspectives. Firstly, the lived experience with the result of a national survey undertaken by Quantum Market Research and Richard and Anita will present those findings. Then we'll hear from Kim from Astrolab Group, who's taken a macro level look at the time and financial cost of commuting from growth areas and the potential for more growth areas residents to embed working from home or close to home within their ongoing work practices. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Richard 
and Anita, and I'll hand the screens over to them. Great, thanks for that, that comprehensive introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me two seconds. Hopefully, everybody can can see that. Yes. Um, so as Bronwyn introduced, uh, I'm from Quantum Market Research. Um, I look after the team at Quantum Market Research. We're a full service market research industry. And, and really to sum up the work, we get very interesting briefs from our clients. Um, rarely are we testing frozen pea packaging or, or FMCG uh, briefs as such. Um, so this, when Bronwyn approached us to, to, to look at this challenge, we were, we were delighted. Um, and I think growth areas are, are close to our heart. It's certainly a com community or communities that we've we've heavily researched for a range of clients. And whether that's this current study in terms of working from home or community safety, bushfire preparedness um, in Victoria specifically, infrastructure needs, and also attitudes to the environment. So um, yeah, look, a, a really interesting piece to, to be working on and, and to share some of these results with you today. I just wanna set the scene because the way that we've conducted this research has been, been slightly different. So um, I'd like you to cast your mind back to the, the kind of the day that we were sent home from that office um, back in, in late March um, from your working environments in that, that initial lockdown. And that was the day that we started this piece of research called Australia Now. Seems quite a long time ago now. Um, at the time we were sent home, thought it would be two weeks. We're now four and a half months later down the line. And since that day, we've been doing 300 interviews a day, five days a week. And this has provided us with a really rich understanding of how Australians are feeling, thinking, behaving, in, in these recent times. And results from this, this study have, have shaped federal government campaigns. Um, they've helped brands understand how we should be communicating and, and talking to these customers at this time. And this, this vehicle of Australia now was perfect for the, the challenge that, that Bronwyn and the team had at, at NGAA. And so we could leverage uh, Australia now to address the objectives that, that were laid out in front of us. Um, both quickly but also cost efficiently. So we dropped a question set into um, the Australia Now project from uh, the 21st of May to the 21st of June. So I think it's important to think about that context of when this was conducted. And we asked key questions in terms of health and general well-being, impact of restrictions on travel, on work, um, importantly for this piece, and the impact it's had on the, the household. And over those four weeks, it provided us with, with a really robust sample of um, residents who, who live in growth areas. You can see from the right-hand side of the this, this slide there, we, we, we achieved over 6,000 interviews in total. Almost 2,000 resided in growth areas, as defined by those, those suburbs there. And we've also got a comparable sample of 4,000 that didn't reside in the non-growth areas. So we've got a point of context, a point of comparison, which is, which is really important. I think another important thing to mention is how we framed a lot of the questions. We really wanted to pull this piece of research away from the crisis itself. So a lot of the questions were, were framed in a way to get people to think about their situation, but in the absence of, of COVID. Um, what we wanted to really get to was really this idea of, of working from home in the, in the future. And so we certainly framed up some of those, those questions in that way. Um, because there has been a lot of negativity that's come with this crisis. Um, people made redundant, being stood down, juggling kids at home. Um, and, and despite all of these things, I think we've got a really positive story here that we'll, we'll work through today. To start with, I just really want to set the scene. Um, so in addition to Australia now, we've also been running Australia Scan that's been running for 25 years. And in the, the, the last 25 years, or I guess since 2000, um, we've been tracking the aspirations of Australians. And, and, and I think it's really interesting just to frame this and give it some bigger context in terms of four out of the six signs of success and accomplishment haven't changed in two decades. People are still striving towards the same things. These things are consistent, they're fundamental, they don't change, they're woven into who we are, into our DNA, um, the expectations placed on us by society. And I think these are enduring traits that won't go away in a post-COVID world. Certainly some of these have been 
extremely compromised by the, the current situation, but they'll still be there when we come out of this. And I think as we work through today, and I think this is a broader discussion in terms of how our growth areas can actually support Australians to realise these signs of success, I think that's important. One of the things that is new for the kind of last three or four years that it is emerging is about having time to do things that you enjoy. Um, so certainly since 2000, pre-smartphones, pre-online shopping, pre-social media, pre-emails on the go, pre-longer commutes, um, we're now seeing this emerge as, as, as an important thing and it's an important thing to reflect on. So, tiny bit of context, more to the, the situation that we're living in. Um, and I think it's important to reflect on who our growth communities are. They are slightly different from maybe other communities. And, and these three charts that I'll show you here really help define that. So certainly those living in uh, growth areas are less likely to have a bit of a financial buffer. And so are more likely to, to find themselves in financial strife if, if hardship occurs. In addition, um, we're also seeing that growth areas have a slightly higher proportion of people on home duties. And also the demographic life stage breakup is slightly different in growth areas, more likely to be young family, middle family. So I think it's important to think about the working from home situation, the ability to, to go to work if you're on home duties and things like this as we work through today's presentation. So to set the scene, working from home. Look, working from home, I think, has always been a part of the growth area model and COVID has simply accelerated this. So if we look to some results um, in terms of getting people to look back on what they were doing last year, we can actually see a fair few people were working from home at least once a day, one, one day per week, um, around 42%, around two in five. And this has actually increased to um, around 57% working from home um, at least one day a week. So I think importantly, it's not, a, it's not a big shift for this community. Those in growth areas were already doing this. It's just that it's stretched slightly. I think we've got to remember that the proportion of those in growth areas um, who can work from home is potentially slightly less than other areas. More people work in manufacturing, those jobs where they have to attend a a work site and so that's important there are some constraints in terms of the number of people that that will be working from home and what we also see with that increase in working from home is a profound effect on the amount of time that people are actually investing in commuting with almost one in two actually now spending less time on commuting what we found in the survey was that actually the average commute for somebody living in, the gro in a growth area was 23 kilometers each way. It's a pretty significant journey. And 30% are actually traveling more than 30 kilometers each way each day. And a large proportion of those drive. And now I, there's lots of academic research out there about long commutes. Um, Deacon for, uh, specifically has, has highlighted that, that those long commutes in the car are consistently associated with, with health issues, premature mortality, type 2 diabetes, and, and other risk factors. But there's also the stress. We'd, we've been doing a qualitative piece of work at the moment for the National Faster Rail Agency, and the, the stress that driving creates is, is immense. Um, the lack of predictability, the lack of control, uh, the congestion, um, all, all points to a, a stressful picture. So less time commuting for people in the, in the, in the fringes, in our growth suburbs, uh, has, has an important impact on their lives. For those that still commute, it has also affected them. There's less traffic, there's less stress, it's more predictable because of less volumes. So I think this, this slide is really important because it, it paints a picture in terms of what, what's the opportunity that this extra time presents? What utility can we actually extract from this time that people residing in the, the growth suburbs now have? Increased productivity, improved health and well-being, greater dwell time within our communities to, to spend with local businesses. Um, greater opportunity to, for others to, to, 
to join the workforce. So that really sets the scene. What about the future? Let's turn our attention to that. Um, I guess a lot of people have been saying, well, we're all going to bounce back to our old ways. Uh, we'll go back to our old dirty habits when this is all over. Um, I don't agree. I think there's some fundamental changes that are happening and we won't all revert back from, to working in the office five days a week. So what do people want if we ask them? Certainly post restrictions, we're seeing a similar proportion of those people wanting to work from home full time, but also work from home sometimes. I think this is a really common discussion that we're having. People want to have this hybrid model of working. Great, I'm at home some days a week, but I also need that connection in the office to, to ensure that I'm in touch with my organization's culture, uh, collaborate where it's difficult to, to do things from home. And, and this hybrid fashion certainly seems to be gaining wide appeal. And we can see that on this slide here, the preference for a blended approach, 43% looking for that. I think it is interesting looking at the other, at either end of the, the scale, um, certainly for those people that would prefer working from home five days a week, certainly the commute is getting in the way of a blended approach or working from the office, but also the idea that they've created a great working environment at home um, and less of those day-to-day -day dis distractions, which not all of us have. I can hear my four-year-old running around upstairs at the moment, um, distracting me as I'm trying to present. At the other end of the scale, um, people who want to get back to the workplace. We've heard a lot of stories about struggling mental health and poor setup in the, the home office. You can see that I've got a makeshift uh, office here in a spare bedroom. Um, people missing that connection and that social nature of work. And I think this is a really important bit. Like how can we replicate maybe some of those aspects in our growth suburbs? The idea that we could have some co-working spaces to bring together like-minded workers and, and maybe support this, this blended approach or those that, that prefer working in a, at a workplace. And I think that's an important thing to come as we see other things emerging from this crisis around mental health um, and some of the consequences of, of working from home. Now look at the time when this was conducted, we, we, we saw some really positive impacts on a number of different dimensions um, of working from home. And you can see here that largely there has either been no impact or a positive impact across a number of the areas that we measured. Time to relax, time spent on household chores, not sure whether that's a good or a bad thing. Certainly the amount you get to, the amount of sleep you get very good positive impact there. And I think the interesting thing is then looking at comparing those people that reside in growth areas to those in non-growth areas. So what's the, what's the delta, what's the difference? What's the dividend you get in these growth areas? Well, we can see here that um, certainly there's a big impact on those people in growth areas around quality, length, length of sleep. And I would say the quality of sleep as well, compared with somebody in an, a non-growth area. This is some real, big benefits there and again in context with when this happened um, things would have changed since then I think people would have found it quite novel at the time so some of these results may have may have softened since then but still largely positive for those that are in growth areas. I'm going to hand over to Anita who's going to talk about the indirect impacts so I've spoken very much about those audiences that can work from home um, what about those people that are already at home, not necessarily in the workforce? What impact has this had on them? Anita. Thanks, Richard. So yes, I'll be walking through um, those that are living in growth areas that are not currently in the workforce. So as you might imagine, some of them will be living in households with more than one person, and some of those people will now be working from home. So what's the interplay between those two groups of people? What's the dynamic that we see coming through when you've now got somebody else from your household working at home? Well, actually, the results that we saw here were surprisingly positive. And again, bearing in mind that this was done in um, May to June, so when this was kind of a bit more novel, um, we saw that there was a really positive impact on the relationship that they had with other people in their household. So half of people saw a positive impact on relationships with others in the household. 
There's also a clear net positive effect on the time people were saying they had available to exercise and the amount of sleep that they got. So as we know, at this time, looking after our physical and mental health is incredibly important. So anything that has positive benefits on those metrics is really important. Um, we also see that the positive effects of having somebody else in your household working from home are more pronounced in the growth areas than in the non-growth areas, particularly around um, relationships with people in the household and the amount of sleep that they're getting, funnily enough. So considering the indirect impacts of being able to work from home, what impact will this have on those that are currently not in the workforce? So if we flip to the next slide, among those in growth areas, just over half of people not currently in the workforce said that they would be very or somewhat likely to seek part-time work or return to the workforce if they were able to work from home at least some of the time. And two in five uh, said that they would be very or somewhat likely to seek full-time work if they could work from home some or part of the time. This really speaks to a latent desire to enter into the workforce. If the barriers of travel and the associated time and costs were removed, that desire was particularly prevalent among um, under 40s and people with children under five in the household. Uh, almost two thirds of them said that they were likely to seek a return to part time work if they could work from home at least some of the time. So flicking on to the next slide, the option to enter into the workforce by working from home would also provide opportunities to strengthen local communities by using local businesses and services more so. Um, so those in growth areas, three quarters of them said that they'd be likely to use local businesses and services if they were working from home more of the time. It also promotes health and well-being by allowing time to fit in exercise. And there's some indication as well of building capacity and building skills by taking up study, learning new skills and professional development if they had that freed up time by working from home. Um, I think next I hand back to Richard to summarise um, the working from home situation of those in the workforce. Thanks, Anita. And I must just highlight that this is a very quick snapshot of the results. There is a bigger, deeper report behind all of this. Um, so look, really, just to just to summarise some of the key points, certainly there's there's economic benefits um, around working from home. And really, that is driven by less money being spent on commuting. Where do, where can that money now go? Can that help support maybe some of those people that don't have that financial buffer? Will they be spending more within the local community, supporting those local businesses as, as dwell time is increased? Certainly we've seen some reported productivity benefits early on in these, early on in this piece. Um, I think there's a question mark in terms of is that sustainable in terms of the style and the pace that we're, we're all working from home? How does that pan out in the future? But those early, early signs were that there's been some positive impacts on the quality of work, on job satisfaction, on productivity, on morale. And certainly it suits some personalities to others. And there's a, there's a lot of emerging research in this area um, at the moment. But importantly, some of those social benefits of working from home, um, certainly directly in terms of the, the health impacts, the ability to spend more time sleeping, um, for somebody who's commuting two hours each way each day, um, the need to get more sleep is, is obviously critical. Um, but spending quality time with the family. And obviously a large number or a higher proportion of people in growth areas are that, that young to mid family age where, where, where quality time with the family is, is, is really important. And then just turning to, to some of those indirect um, benefits from those that are not currently in the workforce? Yes, so among those not currently in the workforce, we see that providing the possibility of working from home at least some of the time 
might unlock that latent desire to enter into the workforce, with around half saying they'd be likely to seek part-time work if they could do um, working from home at least some of the time. This drives a positive impact for the individual themselves entering the workforce in terms of their finances, feeling like they have purpose and feeling like they're contributing to their household and society. But it also drives positives for the local communities, given that three quarters of them said that they'd be likely to use local businesses and services more if they were working from home. And it also um, provides social benefits, such as positive impact on relationships with others in the household and having time to exercise. So all in all, there's economic benefits, social benefits and community benefits that can be realised if working from home was uh, more of a possibility going forward. I'll hand back over to Bronwyn. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Richard and Anita. Um, yeah. Finding some really interesting findings. The full report will be available um, after this session. But, um, Richard, I'll just mute you there. I think we're getting some feedback from you. So um, really it is um, lots of opportunities evolving. And you know, I think our advocacy position needs to be that it would be a shame to not take advantage of this opportunity right in front of us. So we do have um, a couple of questions coming through, which we'll get um, to in the Q&A session, but I'll just um, identify, uh, ask Richard and Anita perhaps to pull up their slide for, for later on, on the types of industries where people were, could work from home. There's been some interest in, in that breakdown of occupations and industries. So in the meantime though, I'll hand over to Kim Johnson uh, from Astrolabe Group, who um, has done some fantastic work looking at the big picture level of what this all means. Um, and so, Kim, I'll hand over to you. Oh, look, thank you very much, Bronwyn. And uh, Richard and Anita, that's really, really interesting work um, that uh, will really, uh, I think, complement really well the work that we've done at Astrolabe Group. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, on whom we're all meeting. I'm talking to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in Sydney. Um, and so hello to everyone and um, a big hello particularly to people in Melbourne because we are watching you and our hearts go out to you because it is pretty, uh, it's frightening to watch from afar and we are thinking about you um, in the middle of it. Um, I'm a demographer by background, uh, so people and place are at the heart of everything that I do and that really has informed this research and was the springboard for a conversation that we had with Bronwyn about well, what was this potential population impact of working from home for people in the outer growth areas and I'm just going to check that my slides are uh, Changing? No, they are not. So just let me go over here. I am sorry. Ah, there we go. Uh, apologies for that. So I'm going to start. Uh, we have prepared a report and I'm, I've only got 10 minutes, so I can't go into the, all of the details. So I want to start with our top five insights. Uh, look, as the research from Quantum have already showed, people in the outer growth suburbs across Australia are travelling a long way to get to work. Four out of five people who are working in those areas travel more than five kilometres, but most actually travel 10 to 30. 1.3 million people across Australia travel more than 10 kilometres just to get to work one way, and that's a long way. And we also know in a lot of the outer growth areas that even if it's not a long distance, sometimes where there might not be good roads infrastructure or traffic lights, even getting 5Ks from home onto the freeway into a place of work can take a really long time just because the traffic doesn't flow. So people are traveling a long way and lots of people are traveling a long way. So we've got at least over one and a half million traveling more than five kilometers. 
We also know that men are traveling more than women. There's a real gendered impact of the way that we're seeing these long-term commutes. Full-time workers are more likely to travel the longer distance compared to part-time workers. Although having said that, while three quarters of full-time workers will travel 10 kilometers or more, 60% of part-time workers will travel that distance as well. Um, but we do see these gendered impact. And of course, that ability to commute then has an impact on income, um, participation in home life. And I think the quantum research really highlighted just what it means when people don't have to spend a couple of hours or more just getting to work and so on. Um, the, the cost, I mean, that's come through. I know living in inner city, uh, Sydney, I've saved thousands of dollars not commuting. And so if this commute was two to three times as longer at an individual level, um, there's big savings. And I'm going to talk to just what some of those numbers look like. But on average, the daily commute by car is $36, taking into account just the running costs um, and tolls, average tolls and average parking. Um, and we think that that's probably a conservative estimate. Uh, and this whole idea of what are the jobs that can be done from home, we know that there are a lot of people working from home. There's at least half a million jobs just looking at how occupations and industries are categorised that could be done from home. And that is based on, on you know, just categorised data. And we expect that there are many, many more. And especially if we think about how we might plan for the future. So this notion of the cost of commuting really translates into a significant cost to these outer growth suburb communities across all of Australia. So you can see $7.4 billion, the total cost of commuting from the outer growth suburbs. Now we created this as an estimate based on those average commuting costs for our people from the outer growth suburbs. We use census data to inform what the average length of commutes were. We took into account what the running costs were for um, you know, petrol, tolls, parking, for getting to and from work. Uh, and we estimated that people would work uh, every day, take four weeks annual leave, um, and halved that for part-time work as an average. When we first started calculating these numbers, we have gone back and checked this, because this is quite mind-blowing when you start taking that, like what does it cost, that $36 that it might cost for one person, when you start multiplying that by the sheer volume of people who are living in outer growth suburbs and who are making these long commutes, it transla translates into a hell of a lot of money. So that's a lot of money for households and particularly at the moment, that's really significant. The other part of this you know, concept of how much it costs is that when people are doing these commutes away from home for over 10 kilometres and further, spending happens at their place of work as opposed to when they might be closer to home. And so we've, you know, we've we talk about this kind of coffee tax or a coffee index. What is the cost to a community of someone buying a, co a coffee at their destination when they make this commute versus when at their point of origin. And you can see there like $1.4 billion spent outside of outer growth suburbs when people are doing that commute just in a, in a coffee tax. And so for the outer growth suburbs and local communities, there's a real opportunity to think about what are the local economic impacts of being able to support people to work from home in an ongoing way so that they do, as the quantum research has shown, that money is spent locally, it's local businesses. And we think about the five kilometre radius of the stage four lockdowns in Melbourne, that becomes even more critical. Um, what, are the, what are the services that are available that people can access? And, you know, it's 
actually much easier based on population level data to think about what the costs are because you can quantify it much more easily. But when we looked at those average distances that people are traveling, looked at the kind of time frames, um, it's significant amounts of time that are being spent as well. So even if people on average commuted one day less a year, we estimated that would be at least 92 hours a year saved. And that just, you know, ability to not be in the car for that distance and do, do other um, points of time. Then the other thing to just note about the costs is, you know, that, that $36 average cost for a car, it's eleven dollars an average for public transport, but most people do drive to work, as the quantum research also showed. About three quarters of people drive rather than take public transport, and part of that is the time, but also the difficulty uh, getting to the, the the point of departure. One of the things that we looked at was we prepared summaries for each of the state. Uh, capitals based on average uh, travel times and what the average costs were based on um, those running costs for cars, public transport costs, um, and so forth. Um, and really what comes through again and again is this time and distance travelled. And so in the report we prepared, we um, did one case study for um, comparing travel from Oran Park which is in Camden, one of the, the places on this map here of Sydney, and compared it with a commute from Marrickville, which is in the inner west. Um, and while there were certainly cost differences, um, the biggest issue was time. So it was two and a half hours to drive versus about 40 minutes um, for Marrickville, but three hours to catch public transport from the outer growth, from Oran Park in the outer growth area of Sydney, because there were needing to take one bus and two trains, just the difficulty getting to that point of departure from the outer growth suburb into, into the inner city. And so that time factor kept coming through again and again. Um, I think what is most interesting is that there is a really compelling case that this is an issue, the ability to work from home, there are real, uh, you know, social benefits from people being able to do it. We know that there are really negative impacts, not just for individuals in terms of health and so forth from long commutes, but also for communities. Um, it puts pressure on uh, marriages and, and, and partnerships. It can lead to higher rates of um, divorce. It can have flow on effects for stress that leads to family violence, for example, mental illness. Um, and so, there are these really benefits. So what do we need to do to really think about how do we advocate for much more systematic change so that this is not just an anomaly? And the first thing is to really understand what's happening. And so this research that we are talking about today is a really important part of it. It's also important not just to understand the impact on us as workers, but what are the... Um, and implications for employers. So we've demonstrated that we can work from home. Uh, many employers are talking about, you know, um, that productivity has been maintained, it's been good for business. Uh, but what are the things that actually are needed to make that embedded? And I think having these continuing conversations is part of that process. I think really understanding what the jobs are. So we looked in our research at what the occupations were that people could do as recorded in the census. Um, and the occupations are coded in the same way across census and employment studies and the kind of official statistical um, database that's captured. But those are simply a list of jobs and you can make an assessment on whether they can be done at home or not, um, but it doesn't actually give any of the detail. We also know that there are many jobs that have moved to being done from home that were never done before. My son sees a paediatric psychologist, for example, and we've had Zoom 
consults, which we would never have been able to do before COVID. Um, and so we're talking about psychology all of a sudden being a you know, remote work from home profession that I don't think we would have had that conversation before. And certainly that, that kind of telehealth is one thing that we're seeing moving. And, um, but I think thinking about um, new ways of doing jobs and what that might mean for new business models is, is part of this conversation. The other challenge we've got is we don't actually know all the jobs that people are doing because we have old codes. Um, Data are coded according to the Australia New Zealand Statistical Classification of Occupations. It was last reviewed about 10 years ago. And there are some jobs that simply are not there, like data scientist. Well, that's an important job for many businesses. Um, we see that rolled out through smart cities, for example, as a key skill needed to leverage the availability of data but we actually don't know how many there are in Australia employed in the official statistical record. The other challenge we have is some is that jobs are classified by occupation, but they're also classified by industry and they're not necessarily cross classified. So occupation is that job you do. The industry is, well, what is it that's actually created by that industry? And so the numbers don't necessarily match. So we have a sense of what industries might be able to be done from home, but not necessarily which parts of it there. And I think an important thing for those of you who are listening from councils is what does this working from home mean for infrastructure? What does it mean for land use planning if people are needing places to have face-to-face -face meetings in the suburbs as opposed to traveling into the inner city? Uh, what does it mean for integrated transport if people are wanting to drive to a place or not be on a train for an hour or two hours? Like certainly at the moment, that is a real barrier for people wanting to do long commutes is just not wanting to be in a train or a bus carriage. Um, what needs to be thought about for that local job generation? There's been lots of talk about localised small scale manufacturing, for example, but how does that link up to supply chain? I think these are some of the critical issues and questions that really will facilitate this ability to, for people to be able to work from home long term or not even just work from home, but work from a place near their home. I mean, I work in inner city Sydney. I want a place to work that's like a walk down the road from me. So I can imagine that being replicated everywhere. I'm aware that I need to stop Bronwyn because you give me the wave. <laughs> and I will stop sharing my screen and go back to you. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad, um, I'm glad that uh, little wave worked. It's also interesting though, that's, that's the issue. So um, we'll move on to the um, Q&A session and we've got a few questions coming in, which is fantastic. So I wanted to start with one to um, Quantum, which was around, um, you know, that when we were asking people about um, their work from home um, practices pre-COVID and during COVID, can you identify which sort of industries that those or occupations those people were working in? And then I just, so maybe Richard or Anita can answer that one. And, and I also just wanted to delve a little bit into um, the uh, people who are not currently in the workforce. If you have any more information, um, perhaps Anita, on um, whether any other information that you gain from them about their desire to return to work. So Richard, I'll perhaps go to you first. Great, thanks Bronwyn. Um, I'm just gonna bring up a quick slide that gives us a bit of an indication in terms of who was working um, from home. Now this is just looking at those people that, that are working from home. Um, so not necessarily pre, but we know that there, ha there wasn't huge shifts pre to post. It's just that those, those have been extended as, as such. So um, look, certainly if we look at those industries where people are working from at home, it is those industries where you can work from home. IT, financial and insurance, professional scientific and technical services, 
administrative and support services versus those that have got fixed areas, retail trade, other services, healthcare assistance, accommodation, food services. Manufacturing was already quite high um, uh, originally, so um, that, that didn't come out in this, this difference analysis here. Um, so certainly that gives a, a bit of an indication as to, as to where. Um, in terms of the people not in the workforce, look, a lot of those, looking at the data, it was more around, I guess, people that had been on home duties for a period of time. Again, young families, now the kids are at school. I want to get back to doing what I was pre-kids and, and, and what's needed to, to help me. And certainly, if I can work from home, that's going to make that journey a lot easier for me. Um, certainly, with some, some other work we've been doing with clients, we're seeing some interest in getting reskilled or, or upskilled from, from those types of workers. Um, wow, I suddenly can work from home and do this job. Let me start getting my skills back and, and, and start applying for jobs. Despite difficult economic times at the moment, there is that, that drive and that aspiration there. So um, certainly I see it maybe slightly female skewed because of working mums from home um, and some, some great opportunities for that cohort there to, 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 to bring them back into the workforce. Thanks, Richard. And that certainly um, is a great, evidence base for the anecdotal evidence that we have and the case studies that we've um, produced over the years that show many women simply do not have enough hours in the day to combine uh, childcare and school drop off, then a commute into the city or to another employment centre and then back into by the time childcare closes. So Yeah. And just to add, especially if your partner's got your seven and a half working hour day plus the two hour commute either end it doesn't leave much opportunity to even start that discussion it's a it's a really hard hard area to to, to challenge yeah. now we're at home we can start exploring those options and i think another um uh, section within that question which will be in the full report that we will circulate to everyone is that desire for people not in the workforce currently to perhaps start some freelancing or a home-based business or you know that entrepreneurial spirit I suppose so I think that's going to have a really big impact on local government and our economic development teams and and what they can do and knowing that if, if there's another person in the household at home to share in those domestic duties um, there's a whole cohort of people who you know may be interested in in that sort of uh, entrepreneurial startup. So I think it's a great opportunity for local government. And I'll just continue that and perhaps um, tie in another question here, which is around models um, of, uh, is there any research, it's from Mark Noonan, so is there any research on what model of urban fringe co-working might be most viable? Um, fee or free, open or controlled, um, standard of amenity and facilitated environment. Is it the cafe slash library experience people could be most attracted to for this purpose? Um, well, I, I think I can uh, kick off and then ask others if, if they have some input there. What we um, have seen through our NGAA membership are several different models. So there's one, um, you know, for example, in Melton, we have the Western base which was um, funded through a project called the Suburban Jobs Program um, probably I'd say five years ago now also the Stretton Centre um, in the city of Playford in Adelaide's North and and they've been fantastically effective at supporting startups um, and creating jobs so they are product they, they you know sort of um, hosted or auspiced by by the by local government um, and there are some external parties involved, some long-term leases, some, some council presence um, at those sites, and they've been tremendously effective. Another model is down at the um, Casey Cardinia region in Southeast Melbourne, where um, the economic development team actually sits in um, the business hub, which is privately managed, and you know, it's an absolute um, hub of energy. So I think there are a couple of options there. Um, we've done a little bit of research just collating the, those different um, styles of co-working space, but I think 
post pandemic and post social distancing requirements, there may, may be a need for some additional research on, on what that will look like in the future. So open to others for, for comment. Yeah, I, I look, I just really want, agree that it's going to be um, a range of models. And I think this um, is goes to that point of we need to understand what workers need, but also employers, because some of those models will depend, you know, so for the banking industry, for example, are there issues around, you know, security of the location and the, the data that's being downloaded? and so forth. I think being able to monitor different models and what works. So um, Central Coast, for example, north of Sydney has a large commuter population. The council itself is piloting um, a, you know, working from home fully, working in the office and a hybrid model and, you know, recording what it means for the workers and for council as their employer, so internally. And I think the more that organisations who are employers um, and research um, organisations can start to capture what is actually happening and what works, we'll speak to that because, you know, the library cafe is good for some types of work, but there are different types of work where you might need something much more, um, you know, you, and for just like, thinking about Astrolab Group, we have been working from home since the beginning um, and will continue to do so. And now our challenge is where are those places that we can meet for the face-to-face -face meetings that we do need when we do need to actually engage in, you know, Zooms is great for a bit of a, you know, th these are the things we have to get done on our meeting, but what about when we want to brainstorm new ideas? So where do we meet? Well, there's lots of, lots of you know, options there, um, but what are the considerations, you know, that, you know, we can close the door. There's a whiteboard. We can park at the moment because the train is a bit scary. So I think, yeah, just thinking about the, the different types of ways that people need to work and meet will then influence what you come up with. Mm. Good point, thanks. I, yeah, fully agree with, with both of you there. It is that there is going to be a diversity of needs and it depends on really that, that employer, but also how that employee feels. So certainly from, from this bit of research, the idea that a, a co-working space um, provides a bit more kind of face-to-face -face social connection with people. Um, the ability to get out of the house and just have a different environment is is really the thing that's driving that need at the moment. Um, but again, that kind of scale from just being able to go and sit down and have a coffee with somebody similar through to maybe providing collaborative video conferencing facilities so we can get a team in a room and communicate with the team in, in another location. So I think there's, there's certainly different scales there. Yeah, agreed, and, and agree agree completely with Ali Dench, who who just posted a question or, or a comment around digital connectivity and and yes. <laughs> um, so many black spots. So you know, I think um, you know that's certainly um, something that we'll need to ramp up our advocacy on. So before getting to that broader question around um, advocacy, I'll, I'll just answer the other one that's on the screen there um, on the Q and A around the implications the transport infrastructure priorities for outer urban areas. And, and Kim, I'll get you to jump in on this in a moment too, but uh, for us, I think it, it's it potentially a game changer. Um, there is still a lot of catching up to do um, to make sure that growth areas, infrastructure, transport infrastructure in particular, meets um, required levels. So, you know, we'll need to take stock at some point when all of these stimulus packages and additional major projects and supported projects are, are um, underway to really see, you know, what's the fallout of all of this and, and what still has not been addressed, what still has not been funded. But, um, uh, you know, I've seen some interesting reports from um, one of our research and practice reference group members at, at Wyndham City Council just on the amount of traffic within Wyndham City Council and, and how that has, has changed and then reverted back to, to pre-COVID levels almost and, and obviously now is, is very low. But um, I think it's we're really going to have to take stock of, of, of what has been funded and, and committed to during all of these stimulus processes. 
And then I think we need to really um, make sure that we look at the local local transport infrastructure. So there's, there's just no um, space these days to build a greenfield site where the buses can't get through or the bus stop is built 10 years before the bus service arrives. We just can't do that anymore. We need active transport. You know, we need those sort of local connected communities um, and, and connecting across the region. So from employment hub to employment hub, we need to really um, continue our advocacy to move away from everything going straight into the CBD. So um, Kim, you just got, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So if you've got a quick comment on that. Yeah, look, I suppose, you know, the, the, tr the transport infrastructure, you know, one part of that is how people are going to work. And, you know, we've just got to keep watching that because that'll be important. The second part is, as a demographer, the complete black swan for what is going to happen after this is internal migration. We've pretty good idea about overseas migration, fertility and mortality, but internal migration, actually, we have no clues yet. We've got lots of theories but no clues and that'll have an impact on transport demands and I think this you know we were actually at that point of you know public transport ride share electric cars and I think COVID has completely kind of put a halt to that thinking and so it is really what happens with that momentum because people don't want at the moment are not wanting to get on public transport mm. Mm. That is something we really need to be thinking about. I'd hate to think that we're just going back to more and more cars. So what would it look like to do that in a safe way, um, yeah. you know, yeah. and in a way people are comfortable with? And that's yeah. my that's thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so I'll just quickly answer that last question, which is around how we at National Growth Areas Alliance now need to adjust our advocacy platform and, and really, um, this is a process we'll be going through over coming months, but um, the impetus is there to make sure this opportunity is not wasted and, and that we don't revert to pre-COVID form, which didn't really benefit um, residents to any, any degree in our areas. So we'll definitely need to look at transport, um, transport infrastructure. We certainly need to refocus on community and social infrastructure if if it if and town center development urban design so if if a town center is is designed and built and now has 50 percent more people there every day during the day what else is going to be needed and, and so we need to sort of use this opportunity to reimagine how we can um, make sure the potential of growth areas is realized these communities um, can become you know the opportunities there they can become the 20 minute neighborhoods or the 30 minute cities that governments um, aspire to as long as we make sure that working from home component is there um, that it can lead to local job creation as well that we can just cut the requirement to commute the distances that people have been commuting so um, a great question from Robin and, and I think there's there's a lot that we'll need to look at as long as uh, you know there is support from all levels of government to continue the way we're going and not not simply go back to the way things were so i'll um we've wrapped we've wrapped up the questions so thank you very much um yeah as ali Dench said yes digital connectivity could create the one minute city correct <laughs> that's great love it um Look, I'd just like to really thank Richard, Anita and Kim for being online today and for everyone who's joined in. This is our major research project for the year and I think it's going to really shift the way that um, we look at and hopefully decision makers look at growth areas in the future. So um, thank you very much to all of our panellists for all your your um, input and your contribution. I'll note that we will be sending out to everyone who's registered um, the, the reports later today, as well as a, a summary overview of the two pieces that have been produced. We will be now using all of this to have a really good hard look at our policy platform. And our, all of our NGAA members will be um, receiving correspondence and they will hold consultations and really try and get a feel for what this means on the ground and how we can take priorities forward for our members. Um, 
I'd encourage everyone to have a look at our website, ngaa.org.au and the events page especially, because we've got a few more of these types of webinars coming up and we'd love to see people contribute and join into those. So thank you very much, Kim, Anita and Richard. Thanks as well to Helen, Kelly and Melanie, the NGAA team, for all their hard work in, in not only getting these research projects up and running, but such fantastic results and a great webinar today. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.